Well, I want to talk in this space about what we often call integrate and fire neuron model. And I'm going to try to talk about sort of the very basic structure for this. This is one of those models that is extremely popular, extremely enthusiastic by so many uh, who do think about computational neuroscience. It's very much a case of saying, look, I've got something that spikes. And somehow there's this view that once I've moved into spiking, I've somehow moved into biological spaces. That's an interesting debate. Um, the main thought here when you talk about integrated and fire neuron is it it basically is trying to model two key aspects of neurons. One is you're really modeling the recovery period, refractory period recovery from an input current. And when it's sufficiently recovered, well, we just say, look, some nonlinear th threshold is crossed and it spikes again. What is beautiful about it is that uh, it becomes a beautiful first order nonlinear differential equation. It's very, very easy to put in a digital computer, and it's really well matched to digital computing. Um, and that's wonderful if you're a numerical modeler using digital computing. It also should be a slight concern if you're saying, but basically, you know, biologically based computing has huge advantage over digital computing, and you're picking a model that's basically well matched to your digital systems. The one should be careful about what that what that implies. But it does at least it basically does typically abstract out the spiking dynamics. Now there are more complicated versions of it, but in this case, I want to talk about just sort of a basic structure, and really historically the core structure that it comes from. And when people talk about sort of an integrated fire neuron sort of circuit model, um, really the sort of starting one that sort of really got many of these things popular, and there's different history around this, really comes from sort of the model from Carver Mead, which we see um, probably most well explained in the sort of the Analog VLSI and Neural Systems book. Now, this would be chapter 12, this would have been about circa 1989. This was certainly a time when what you see in the circuits and what you see in the modeling are very, very tightly coupled, as if they are today, too, but this was certainly a very popular time for this. And the main part of this is to look at having, say, a transistor where I could, say, have an input current pull. Um, you can kind of flip transistors, NFETs and PFETs, to get very similar behavior. You have two inverters here that basically create a very high gain comparison point. So in other words, if I reach a threshold, then I will, once, once I, if I get to a threshold, then I will effectively change state. Um, in Carver's chapter, he talks about this as sort of being an, an analog version or a biological version of an if statement. If, you know, if it's less than this, do this. If it's once, if it is greater than do something else. And so that's the main part of it. And then with the last piece of the circuitry, which is basically if it changes state, this goes from say one to a zero in this case, that's the way the logic for this circuit would go, we could flip that around easily. Uh, if I reach that, then that would turn this transistor on and allow me to discharge anything that sits off this membrane voltage, which is meant to model what you'd see at a typical neural structure membrane voltage, and then its membrane capacitance. Now, there's a few things that are relevant in here. Obviously, this transistor is a voltage in, so I can put a pull of current through here. Very good. Um, out of the seven transistor element, typically we'll have two different bias points in here. One, reset to control the speed of the reset. Second one here, which is to sort of give me a sort of pull up kind of, of current that kind of limits things. Um, because what one finds in practical implementation is if you're not careful, um, you'll get too much extra switching noise because things will just sort of get jittery. And so slowing that down a little bit actually does um, give you much better dynamics over an overall physical system. And so as a result, that gets you most of it. But if that's all, you'd kind of actually miss one other critical point, which is the fact that what's going to typically happen when I look at the circuit is imagine the membrane voltage is sitting at some potential here. Say say we start at this point. Um, this, where have not spiked, 
which means this whole circuitry is turned off. So this current source is simply pulling off current off of that capacitor. What that would mean is if I'm pulling current constantly off a capacitor, is I will just get a linear decrease over time. And this is exactly what you would get in a measurement, which this is one such measurement. And it would just keep dropping and dropping, dropping over time until it reaches the threshold of this first inverter. Great. We, re we cross the threshold of that first inverter. And what will happen is all of a sudden, this voltage will then drop. All of a sudden, we'll say, well, wait a minute. As soon as I reach that, this voltage drops down rather rapidly. Um, well, what caused that rapid change, right? It happens right, notice that's synchronized exactly to the spike. Well, that change occurs because this voltage moves from, moves from one supply to the other. There's a capacitive coupling between that spike through this capacitive voltage divider. And because it's going to be bringing it down, this voltage goes down dramatically. By this capacitive coupling, this voltage goes down by some amount. And it goes down significantly enough there. What's important about that? Well, that pushes the circuit far enough down and creates a, and some people would talk about as a hysteresis, such that it pulls that voltage far enough down. So that way, now I have something to recover which is happening by these two transistors, and it pulls it back up. And now it's going to pull it all the way back up towards near its threshold, you know, through this dynamic. And all of a sudden, it hits that threshold, and, well, guess what? Then it jumps back up by some amount once it crosses the threshold. And what happens is when that comes back from zero, it goes from zero up to its supply, that means this voltage goes significantly up, and all of a sudden, now, it stops there. It's now just this device pulling current, and I repeat. And so, as a result of having one particular current, I get one spiking frequency through this. And I have enough hysteresis to guarantee that I'm going to primarily be looking at this uh, sort of refractory period behavior. If I put in a higher current uh, and then change my scales, what I will find is that, yes, I will actually get a nice jump. It'll actually drop much faster, do that, and then it'll recover and then jump. Um, and, but it'll, this slope will be much, much faster. This dynamic will be basically the same, but as a result, we've actually gotten a chance to zoom into it to take a look at it. What you would find is that the frequency that you get from the circuit is exactly proportional to the input current. And in fact, it's sort of an integration of a sort. And so this gives you, not only does it a very simple numerical model, but it, um, into first order, this also looks very similar to other engineering systems, particularly a sigma delta modulator. And this is, you know, sigma delta modulators are used for very, very high precision ADCs, you see this in acoustics and other places, uh, where you quickly transform things to a digital uh, modulation and then work with it afterwards. On the other hand, it also tends to take a lot of energy to do these things, both in terms of all of the um, post-processing as well as the transmission of all of the digital signals. That being said, can be very, very valuable. The question is, if I'm looking at biological models and biological computation, is that what I'm asking? And so that's a very interesting question. But it's really important to kind of look at these integrated and fire neuron structures because these become the basis for a tremendous number of different types of computational models and computational approaches.